Today I'm going to be talking about the history of the changing media environment. And one of the things that I want all of you to recognize is that when you came into this college, uh, media was one thing and today it's another and tomorrow it will be another thing. And we're going to look back a little bit at the history of the development of media over time, looking at books, magazines, um, looking at broadcasting, and then um, the role that uh, the internet played in um, changing the entire media landscape. And you have to recognize that information has been around for a long, long time. And initially it was by word of mouth. And then uh, it developed into something very different um, when people were able to write and had ink and had uh, pens and had paper to write on. Uh, that information began to be stored in written form or in printed form. And uh, books uh, were what you might call the first type of printed information and books um, obviously have evolved over time. Today many of you probably have books that are on an iPad, a Kindle, uh, on your laptop or something like that and books are very important to us still. Some individuals learn better when they have a book in their hand, others do not. Uh, having a book in your hand goes back to discussing uh, when the first book was printed and knowing that the first book printed has also been the most printed book over time. And I'd like for you guys to send me uh, some information on what was the first printed book and then also the most printed book over time. And this particular book was often chained to um, structures back in the early day because many people felt like if people had books, then you should control some access to them. And that's one of the reasons why we have the United States is because access to the printed word was a concern to Europeans and they didn't like the restrictions that were occurring in their own country. Um, this particular book has been read and interpreted and reinterpreted and rewritten uh, in some form or fashion, reinterpreted with different words, more modern language has been used. Uh, over time though, books have always been um, something that people consider at times to be things that should be restricted and where some people should not have access to those, uh, those books, that knowledge, in other words. It wasn't until the Gutenberg Press that uh, books were able to be distributed more readily. And then um, here in the United States, uh, some of the first books that were actually published were what we would call the dime novel. And the dime novel was simply sold for 10 cents. And that was quite a lot of money at that particular time. That was in 1860. 1865, um, pulp novels came along. And then in 1935, uh, paperback books, less expensive books, uh, reissuing of books that were paperback instead of hardcover. Uh, and that's what started the Penguin Books Publishing Company by publisher Alan Lane. And then... Let's fast forward a whole lot of time, and um, we have now e-publishing, and um, for years and years and years, it was very difficult to publish a book. Um, you had to go through a book publisher. Uh, these days, there are self-publishing publishers. Um, one of the, Amazon will be counted as one of the very large uh, book distributors. Uh, you can get ebooks, you can get hard copy books from Amazon. Um, another organization called Smashwords is uh, a group that helps uh, individual publish or individual authors get their works published. And that's a growing trend with many, many uh, titles 
associated with uh, Smashwords. You might look that up and find out a little bit about that particular company. Uh, we had a company here in Jonesboro called Rainbow uh, Publishing. Uh, we still have it. Its focus has shifted. It was educational uh, publishing uh, because of the buyouts uh, among book publishers. Uh, much of their work has been reduced beyond educational publishing. Um, many people would say there's an over-commercialization of books. Barnes & Noble seems to have gotten it somewhat right the way their bookstore operates because they've been able to survive whereas uh, some of the other book companies have not been so successful at surviving. So there's a restructuring of books. And then magazines, um, those have been around for a long time. Oftentimes it was for the elite as well. And, oh, I want to go back on the books. Thomas Jefferson, by the way, was, uh, he's the person, president, who donated his library to the library, which became the Library of Congress, which houses... Uh, all the selections of books that we have here in the United States. Back to magazines, uh, Saturday Evening Post uh, began in 1821. That's one of the early uh, magazines that was published here in the United States. It published for 148 years. Um, the Crisis was a magazine published in 1910. It served as the voice of the NAACP. Um, and then magazines really flourished when the railroads took off. And if you wonder why that would be, that would be because uh, magazines uh, needed to be distributed. And like anything, you have to have postal service or some form of getting it to the people. So railroads played a significant role in the advancement of magazines. We have all sorts of magazines, from trade magazines to what we would call consumer magazines. Magazines are very niche oriented, uh, designed for a very specific um, group of individuals. Magazines have evolved to the point where many of them are online. Uh, some of them are still being published. If you go out and you look at a magazine rack, you're going to see a lot of thin magazines. Magazines survive off of advertising um, for the most part. Uh, newspapers also survive off of uh, uh, advertising and newspapers are significant to us uh, they provide a lot of information but one of the issues with newspapers in this day and age is um, they many of them have not been willing to move their content to online venues without a paywall and so newspapers continue to struggle newspapers though if you want real news you're gonna go to a newspaper do you have to go to a newspaper where you hold it? Absolutely not. But um, you could go online and get your news. You might even go on Facebook and social media and they'll have links to their news stories. Uh, to me, they're losing a lot of money because they're not monetizing the social media aspects of, uh, of newspaper business. So that's something some of you maybe will be willing to do and do well in the future. Um, Broadcasting. Broadcasting started in the early 1920s. Uh, radio stations operated uh, across the United States. In uh, 1927, we had the Radio Act, which uh, actually established the Federal Communication Commission, which controls broadcasting. The Federal Communication Commission came along, um, and in 1934, we had the Communications Act, and that act uh, suggested that the Federal Communication Commission would watch over the broadcasting industry. And the reason there's um, a body or an agency that watches over broadcasting is because there's a scarcity of airwaves. And even though you may have 500 channels of broadcasting, um, that's not really all broadcasting. A lot of it is what you would call um, uh, cable-type stations. Uh, stations that uh, simply operate, they're not broadcasting over the air. Uh, some of them do, but many of the networks are not over the air broadcasts, and there's a difference between the two. Uh, and you can go back and look in some of that in uh, your uh, chapters from the Alan Alvaron book. Uh, and of course, those are the first six chapters that are available to you on Blackboard to look at.
television um, didn't really get started until 1939 when it was introduced at the World's Fair. Uh, at the World's Fair, um, that was 1939, so you know what was happening at that particular time. We were in World War II. Uh, the infrastructure was not existing for that because all the resources, natural resources, were going towards the war. All the people that were working were working toward that. Um, all the broadcasting type equipment, though, was used by the military. And that's even true of the Internet. And ARPANET was established in the 1960s, and the Internet was born. The deal is nobody really knew about it until the development of uh, what we would call uh, browsers where you could easily navigate the Internet. And um, that proceeded, and from the Internet... Uh, you have this huge explosion, and probably most of you uh, don't remember life without the Internet. And so you think all of this information is just has always been available, and it is not. In addition, there's information out there that's not available on the Internet. And that's why we have libraries and we have books so that you can go back and read about some of those things. The Internet is a distribution source for information. And so you have to remember it's a distribution source. The internet does not create content. People create content and that's why you are so important in this changing, evolving uh, world that we live in. Um, the importance of individuals is especially pertinent when looking at some of the research data. And you have two items on your blackboard uh, dealing with um, research that was done in 2013 and 2014. It's called the Infinite Dial. You can go online and find it immediately, or you can go to Blackboard, and you have those downloadable slides that are available to you. And when I come back, I'm going to be discussing those particular slides and the importance of what they mean in looking at the changing evolution of um, the audience. <laughs>